So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Social Housing Roundtable. My name is Matthew Baird. Um, I founded the Social Housing Roundtable, I guess, a couple of years ago now during the uh, three years ago, whenever the first pandemic was. I don't even remember anymore. Um, and they've developed into this. Uh, we've just gone past 650 members in the community, um, which is absolutely incredible. Of so many different topics that we've discussed. Um, so it's wonderful to see so many of you with us here today. Um, this whole thing is backed up by my recruitment agency. I am one of those recruiters, but I'm not one of those recruiters. Um, I've been recruiting in the social housing sector for 12 years now. I've worked with actually a number of people who are in the room today, which is great to see. Um, and was called uh, about a year or so ago now, um, the ethical recruiter. And I've never been given a bigger compliment. And so I put it on every bit of marketing I've ever had since. So um, I do try and genuinely recruit ethically and not just from like a oh look i do a bit with edi but i love and care about this sector and and the people that are in it and those leading it we need to make sure that um so i, so I guess whenever i'm recruiting for it it's about making sure that those who are have an have an opportunity to have an impact uh are having the right impact because that seems to be the the keynote of theme almost from the last seven months of doing the round table this year um, I'm also, if anybody's going, going to be co-hosting, I say co-hosting, hosting uh, the CIH Southwest event in uh, about six weeks' time in September. So if you are going to Bristol, please reach out. It'd be great to meet you. Today's topic, um, I met Sarah, I think initially we connected as as so many people, when, uh, as I do, via LinkedIn um, and immediately kind of found a really kind of common uh, theme there of not just that ethics piece already talked about, but real kind of passion for trying to change the sector in the way that it needs to be changed. Um, and embracing that change. And so we got talking about in common and what's going on in the contract you're undertaking at the moment. Um, and then asked whether or not you come on and, and do a round table, but you joined us obviously at the at the live round table we did in Manchester and got some incredible feedback, I think, from the from the community and the group there. So um, it's lovely to have you with us today. I'm really glad you can you can be a part of today. Um, I'm going to leave you to kind of do your own introductions and introduce exactly what in common is about. But in terms of the housekeeping side, if you want to make introductions and things, uh, please feel free to in the chat. If you have questions during kind of the short presentation we've got at the, at the beginning, please stick them in there and I'll bring them through. Um, but once that's over, we do want this one to be a, a big, wide open discussion and forum for thoughts and ideas. There are no, never a stupid question, but more importantly, I don't have any thoughts on I don't mind if you are a support worker who's been in the sector for a week or a chief executive for 20 years everyone in the round table voice is equal to me and always will be so with that in mind sarah i'm going to bring you in uh and introduce i guess today's topic and and where the where the passion for it has come from so over to you thanks so much matt yeah and and thanks for having me here today and it's always a always a pleasure to be involved in any any social housing roundtable discussions i think it's always feels very powerful to be in the room or or albeit the virtual room with people who are really committed to thinking about and doing things differently for those using using housing services so yeah it's really really great to be here um as i mentioned before i get into what what i'm going to talk about today it's probably useful to do a little bit of an introduction to me um and to in common i've got some slides so i'll pop them on the screen now um so yes a brief introduction to my to myself and to in common so hello i'm sarah lusty uh my pronouns are she her i currently work as business developer uh for the is it not it, says it started screen sharing but i can't see the actual presentation uh there we are Lovely. Okay, sorted. perfect <laughs> great fab um so yes i currently work as business development manager at in common we're a small charity based in london with the mission of bringing generations together to build more connected inclusive and age-friendly communities so we connect groups of uh, young people with their older neighbors in sheltered housing um, and in retirement homes and we run sessions with delightful activities for these groups to learn and build friendships together. I wanted to make sure that what I said today wasn't just about our work. Um, I wanted to really 
start by zooming out into that context that we as a charity and the social housing sector are operating in before thinking about a key question of what is the role of housing in building age-friendly communities. As a charity working on intergenerational projects, we have a sort of very specific framing and lens and approach to building more age-friendly communities. And I felt it was important to acknowledge that at the start of the presentation. Um, but later on in the talk, I will mention some examples of our work before we'll have some time for some questions. So to start with the context, as I mentioned, most of this won't be new to you, but I thought it was just useful to fully set out why we need age friendly communities and why this work is important. We know we have an aging population between 2011 and 2021 the proportion of people aged 65 years and over rose from just over 16% to just over 18%. We also know that we have a loneliness crisis on our hands and these two things aren't entirely separate. Nearly a quarter of adults aged 65 and older are considered to be socially isolated. A lot of older people, two fifths of older people say that television is their main company and more than half of those over 75 describe themselves as chronically lonely. We know that um, loneliness is damaging to both physical and mental health. But it's really important that we don't just frame this as a problem faced by older people. Half a million people in the UK regularly go up to a week without seeing anybody. And in a recent study that the Office for National Statistics did, young people between the ages of 16 and 24 were actually the most likely to report themselves as feeling lonely. So we have an aging population, a loneliness crisis facing all ages, but also a more age segregated population. Society is separated along generational lines. A child today has just 5% chance of living in the same neighborhood as someone who's aged over 65. It's clear that this not only impacts on social interactions, but it also has a really profound effect on how people perceive other social groups. Separation leads to othering. People perceive others from a group they don't know as different, often inadvertently grouping them into a singular entity complete with stereotypes and prejudices. Our age segregated society therefore leads to a rise in ageism. Ageism is damaging and it creates divides where there shouldn't be. Aging should be understood as a lifelong process. There isn't one specific age where people become old. Aging is a continuous process of natural change which starts in early adulthood. There aren't clear divides or differences between ages. It's just us that constructs those divides. And so it's us who can work to break them down. We also know that the pandemic really exacerbated social isolation and deepened those generational divides. Lots of those previous opportunities for contact between younger and older people were lost. However, the pandemic did also really make clear the value of connected communities. Where there are more formal and informal networks of local social support, people are able to be more resilient and they have better well-being. People who live in connected communities are happier. This is particularly important in the face of the current health and social care crisis, where a fragmented system and underfunding means that many people are now not receiving the care that they need. Building community capacity through connecting generations is one way of helping people. Creating supportive communities moves us to a more preventative approach to care and support. It relieves existing pressures on services in a system that's currently focused on treatment and prevention is more sustainable in the long term. It's clear with this context set out on the slide 
that there is a need for more age-friendly communities. Things are in crisis, but there is also hope. Connecting communities has a transformative potential and can work to address many of those challenges I've set out. So here we come to the question, what's the role of housing in building age-friendly communities? Again, probably much of what I say about housing won't be new to you. You are the experts. But today's just a different lens and an example to think, to think about those opportunities that housing presents. So I'll start this slide by sort of asking the question, if I asked you to picture a community, what would you see? I know that for me, when I picture a community, I see a network of people and the built environment. Houses to me are at the core of communities. Housing is situated in a really unique intersection in people's lives. It's something we all need and millions across the UK are linked into housing association services. There's therefore a real opportunity of housing as a, as a site to begin building these more connected communities with this sort of reframing of housing as a, as a hub of a place to bring people together. Similarly, if I were to ask you the question um, or to think about the difference between housing and home, what would you think? It's a very classic question um, and there's a, a lot that comes to mind, whether it be emotional attachments or feelings of safety. But the main thing that comes to mind for me is that human aspect. Home is more than just housing. It includes those networks of physical and social support. If housing associations are committed to building homes, then there is importance to think about building those physical and social networks. As we know from my previous context slide, building age-friendly communities is a key way in which you can establish those supportive networks. It's therefore clear that housing has a real opportunity to connect communities as a space where different services are brought together. But I think it's particularly important to think about housing's quite radical potential to build age-friendly communities given the potential for housing systems to contribute to generational divides. Housing models are increasingly age segregated for many good reasons. However, it's important that just because we house like-aged or like-minded people together, communities don't have to become separated and divided. As explored earlier, we know the impact that this can have on isolation and ageism. It could therefore be argued that there's a moral responsibility in the housing sector to challenge this, to ensure that where housing is stratified by age, it's proactively connected into local communities and to young people, particularly knowing the benefits that this can have for everyone involved. So we've talked through the context of why we need age-friendly communities and the important role that housing can play. But I did want to talk through some of the work of In Common. There are lots of different and amazing ways in which you can build age-friendly communities, and we work on just one potential solution. So a reminder of what we do. We match local schools with sheltered housing schemes, delivering intergenerational sessions in partnership with housing associations. We seek to bring energy and joy into the lives of older and younger people and want to live in a world that supports us all to live happy, healthy and fulfilling lives. We have three main strands of our work. We have a Connect programme, which connects primary age children with their older neighbours. A social action programme, which supports young people and older people to come together to create positive change on issues they care about in their community. And we're developing a digital platform to scale up our work across the UK to empower others to connect their communities. This will be the only shameless plug I do, but please do get in touch. We would love to have a chat about the platform to get some of your feedback so we can help to develop a tool that, that works for you. 
But I want to come to that question of why is intergenerational connection our solution? There's extensive research about the benefits of intergenerational connections for cohesive communities, building respect, reducing ageism, broadening social connections, improving well-being for older people, supporting children's social and emotional learning. And we truly believe that through this work, we can build more age-friendly communities for all. This isn't just about bringing children into a space. It's about creating educational environments where everyone can learn. It's about finding shared interests, experiences and solutions. And it's about actively building purpose in older people, placing them as volunteers in our programmes. We put working together, collaboration and community at the heart of our work. It's always best to hear it from the people that we work with. So I've got a couple of quotes where one child visiting Dolliff Close, a sheltered housing scheme in Surrey, said that from our sessions, they have learned that no matter what age, you can always have fun with everyone. And Pat H, one of our older volunteers, said that volunteering with In Common does improve her life. It means she spends less time alone and makes her think differently. She finds that the sessions lift her. So to conclude my presentation today, we have a context of crisis, an aging population, a loneliness epidemic, a health and social care sector in crisis, and increasingly age segregated communities. But we know that building connected and age friendly communities has the potential to address many of these challenges. This is about more than just the work of In Common. It's part of a bigger movement to build thriving, connected, inclusive, age-friendly communities. There are real opportunities for partnerships and collaborative working where housing at the centre of lives and communities has a really important role to play and the potential to make a real difference. So thank you for having me here today. I'll hand back over to Matt. No, thank you, sir. It's really 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 interesting and I know what there have been a number of kind of questions that you and I have discussed and I do want this as I say to open up to a wider platform because that that important piece I think you've mentioned there that I know you and I discussed before is the role that housing has to play in this um you know quite often you do hear oh this is an older person service or it's a younger person service or whatever it might be I know the work within common is obviously mainly focused on that um that primary school kind of that that gap there have you noticed any kind of collaboration between, I'm trying to find the way to say, older, younger people, um, I guess, teenagers or anything like that? How have you found that kind of connection coming through? Has there been much, uh, you know, from, I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of in terms of advantages as well. It's it's that whole generation divide that I'm guessing you're trying to support and, and deliver at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that collaboration between generations is really what, what we try and encourage in our sessions you know I think uh, I think a really good example of that is in our social action program which I mentioned which is with um, slightly older younger people um, age sort of around sort of 14 to 16 age and they are um, they work together with older people in their communities to collaborate on finding solutions to local challenges in their community so there was one recently about the cost of living crisis and um, writing letters to MPs and uh, creating campaigns to to raise money for for charities and it's it's really in creating those spaces for collaboration between generations that we we feel that as I say that's our way of approaching building age-friendly communities it's um we yeah we see the collaboration as that kind of mutual learning it's not going one direction you know it's it's that learning from from each other so yeah I, that's really what what we do is building collaboration between generations and are you finding that it's i think in a in a country at the moment that i think to be fair to say has been very divided politically over the last number of years have you found that there's ever been any hostility between those kind of groups at all from a okay this is just just me asking from a more maybe more difficult question so i appreciate you might not have the answers but there have been a lot of studies which are saying that you know young people 
uh, have got different perceptions of, of the world and what's important than, than old generations. That's very kind of obviously generalizing there. Um, but have you found that that's having an impact as well in terms of seeing things from different points of view? I think we find that people are surprised by how much they have in common. So maybe that's reflective of that piece of like people expect there to be more differences than there are. Um, I also could hand over in terms of past um, past uh, experience of it, I could hand over to Charlotte to come in, who is one of our co-founders, who's also lurking in the meeting. So Charlotte, is there anything else you wanted to, to add on that point? Um, yes, um, lovely to thank, well done Sarah, thank you so much and lovely to be here. Um, yeah, I think we we have had hostility, particularly at the start of programmes. Um, we've worked in communities where um, there has been concerns about um, antisocial behaviour or um, uh, under, like people haven't had particularly positive um, perceptions of young people in their area um, and, and in the other direction as well. So um, those probably feel like the most important projects in some ways. Um, and it can be really valuable to start at the at the young younger age um in the in the primary school age and building those relationships then um where there's perhaps less <laughs> less sense of um of fear to start off with um to then have those connections already starting to build as the young people get older um seeing seeing people on the street having those those actual knowing each other by name um connections which um can take a lot of of kind of fear and misunderstanding out of um uh, interactions um but yes we it, it is there are there are sometimes tensions and there there have been um uh different perceptions but it is wonderful to see as Sarah says when that when people are surprised by how much they they can be um able to find things in common even when they're not necessarily expecting it and do you feel that's kind of helping both parties Charlotte from like obviously like say from the past side of things in terms of I know you've done a lot of feedback. I know, I think, you know, you and I talked as well and a couple of times over Zoom and things. The, I remember you saying that that feedback piece and actually not not just surprise, but almost more customer service is the wrong word as well. But the level of kind of feeling of community increases when when those talks have taken place. And, and like you say, not I guess having kind of allies across multiple generations rather than just kind of your own your own social group. Yeah, massively. Um, I guess we see the impact for young people in in kind of on an individual level. Um, uh, so one um young man who comes to mind, um, who had sadly been bereaved and, um, had a, an incredibly meaningful conversation about bereavement. Um, with uh, a match other person, uh, which was was just a really special time um for him to be able to share an experience that he doesn't have many peer friends who who have had um with someone who who has lost a spouse and um was was a really important relationship I think for him um at, at the individual level at the community level as you were saying Matt um you then have um those those sense of of greater solidarity of um for example the or oh, the traffic problem or the the uh, the cost of living crisis or um, the fact that this particular area looks a bit rubbish is affecting all of us. It's not just a, a problem of, of one generation against each other, um, which is how the media tends to like to spin some of these things. Um, but actually what we're trying to do, particularly with the social action work, is build that sense of solidarity um, that uh, we everyone everyone has a stake in our community and um, most of what we want is in common and we can come together to to try and build that um build that future that that we want and we we find that um uh, often older people are very concerned about issues like youth violence um I've seen seen older people welling up around the issue of young people in their communities not feeling safe um these aren't problems that just one generation cares about actually they are we we're, we are all connected and people do feel um feel really powerfully about these things but don't often have an opportunity to perhaps take action on them together with those who are affected by them that's really really interesting to hear and I, I think like I say that piece and um, of actually having the opportunity to do something about something you care about when maybe it's not seen by society as your problem is really really powerful Jake I'm going to bring you in thank you for being with us today yeah thanks Matt and thanks Sarah for for setting the context there so well really powerful presentation um 
Just a couple of points, really. One more of a, a general question. I mean, this is such an important theme and it's cross-cutting in its nature, as you said. You know, it can be from anything from kind of independent living schemes to, I think, even the way we, we build and procure services and, and buildings uh, to community engagement teams and social value teams, all the way down to probably estates managers and, and property managers. I mean, it, it sounds like it would be really difficult to kind of pull all of this together. But I just wondered, uh, a, a question for you, Sarah, is, is is how, you know, how do you get in the room? You you talked about kind of partnerships uh, with housing associations. Who do you find are the best advocates or champions for this? And, and my second point is just a wider one to say, I don't work day to day uh, in housing associations, but work very closely with them. I was just wondering about everyone else on the call about, uh, you know, clearly this is something which I think a lot of organisations are probably doing already in terms of an older person strategy and a community engagement strategy. So just any um, any kind of best practice or or what other people are doing. Thank you very much, Jake. Sarah, over to you. Thanks, Jake. Um, yeah, in terms of who we work with, we we keep our work local. That's what we find works best. We work in communities. Um, we tend to really work most closely with scheme managers um, in, in our sheltered living schemes. So for example, if, if we reflect on the platform we're building, we're really trying to build those relationships between local scheme managers in sheltered housing schemes and then with teachers in schools, because we see those as the sort of key community points of contact who who know the groups, they know who's living in their sheltered housing schemes, they know what they like. You can make a programme that's really bespoke to them and, and works for that local community. So that's who we tend to work with um, directly on our sort of day-to-day -day delivery. In terms of building partnerships with people, um, we have sort of contacts at all different sort of levels and stages across housing associations. We've got uh, talk to community investment teams and community engagement teams. As you say, some people may have old people strategies. Um, we tend to just try and find the individuals that really uh, are, are interested in this and care about making it happen and, and talk to those people. So it's a not necessarily a, a one size fits all approach. It takes a little bit of finding the people, but but when you do, like they're fab and they make it happen. So yeah, it's great. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thanks. Absolutely brilliant. Michelle, thank you. Do come in. Yeah, I'm just going to reiterate that was a really powerful presentation. And when you mentioned about TV being the only kind of thing that they've got, it actually sent shudders. Um, and, you know, it makes me think about the older developments that we have um, and where the signs used to come up as no ball games. It kind of stopped that interaction. Um and it, it is interesting about this planning thing and, and the developments. When you look at the new developments, it is completely segregated. And there was, I do recall one in Penkridge where they had a, um, an over 55 scheme right in the middle of it. And, you know, I haven't seen that for so, so long. Um, my question to you is how can we help? Um, you know, how can we introduce you to people? I do have a couple of people in mind that, um, do a lot in the community of um, the elderly and they might want to speak to you of how to like get it up into the Staffordshire region for example. Yeah there's lots of ways you can help um, so as I say we've got our sort of more direct delivery stuff with the Connect programme, which is the primary age children and older people that mainly operates around London at the moment um, so if you have people in the London area um, who might be interested in that like do get in touch um, as I say we love to just be connected to people who might be interested who might care and just have a have a chat to them about what we do so um, any contacts and links much appreciated but as you say if we want to um, you may not be based in the London area and we would also love to talk to you so we've got our digital platform that we're currently developing um we're currently piloting this in in locations in london but also in the um, west midlands i think we've got some locations um and we're looking to 
get feedback, have some conversations. As I say we want to make this a tool that really works for for housing associations, works for the sector, works for the people that we're, we're trying to deliver it for. So um, if you think anybody might be interested in having a conversation about that, like put us in touch, touch too. We, we are trying with that digital platform to make it so that we can empower others to use this model that that we know we know who works we've seen it applied and it works um and we want to empower others to to use it in in their communities so yeah do if you think there could be anybody that's interested do just put us in touch and we'd love to have a chat with them it's interesting what michelle said there particularly i mean i remember there's there's still extra care facilities and other things popping up around here that they're all kind of independent villages and i remember when i went out to see some of them like the idea was well, that way we're preventing isolation by having the community to itself kind of thing. But that's self-fulfilling because, you know, it's still got barriers around it to, to everybody else. So I think it's a really interesting point. And I was just doing a bit of kind of Googling whilst, whilst your presentation was on. And I mean, the ONS have said that by 2068, which seems mild way, but definitely will creep up quickly, that we're going to have uh, 8.6 million people aged 65 years and over, which is going to be 26% of the population. So this is not going to be a sort of thing. People are living longer. And it's also very odd that you hear, you know, as, as Michelle said there, you know, over 50, over 55, whatever it might be. That's not old. Like, let's not get away from the fact that, you know, retirement age is, isn't is in that bracket anymore. So I think that mindset as well really, really needs to change from, a, you know, what is old. And, you know, we, we see such a uh, disparity of, of connection at the moment, even between young people, their parents, people my parents' age, and then the elderly, you know, there's almost four generations that are all seeing things very, very differently and pulling from different mindsets. So things like this are going to be absolutely brilliant. But I'll bring in people who are who are desperate to talk. Uh, Nadine, uh, please do join. Oh, we've just got your mute. So there we are, lovely. I'm sorry, because my kids are shouting and I'm just like, <laughs> at the door. <laughs> Why is it down? Sorry, guys. How are you? Don't worry at all. Welcome to the summer holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So to be fair, I've, I've just started um, my role not too long ago. So two months ago, um, previously working in a primary school. So I used to be off when the kids are off. But um, yeah, those days are over. Um, but yeah, currently working for Southern Housing and working as a project lead for the Over 55s project. Um, and actually have been trying to contact uh, schools to see um, how to kind of collaborate. But I'm finding that, you know, it's all the kind of red tape in regards to um, safeguarding and, 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 and their scheduling at schools to try and fit it in. Does it fall under any kind of... Um, any kind of learning links to school, which enables them to kind of see as actually the kids are benefiting from... Um, PSHE or something do you see what I mean because I feel like they're trying to see how, how can that work and how does it fit for us but there's a benefit a mutual benefit for both you know yeah sounds like you've got great expertise and experience for this kind of work with working in primary schools and child's housing ideal um yeah you're 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 bang on there we tend to fit it in with with PSHE often um I can hand over to Charlotte in a second because there's there's definitely some specific parts of the, the curriculum that we we fit it in with and yeah in terms of we know that there are can be barriers around sort of issues like safeguarding so we find that as an organization with a sort of proved track record of doing these things it's 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 quite handy to sort of come in with our with our policies and approaches so yeah Charlotte I'll hand over to you on those couple of points oh yeah um yeah absolutely building the partnerships with schools is probably the most challenging part of the whole picture and um, because schools are so overwhelmed and busy um, as you know Nadine um, but we we tend we kind of really focus on what is the benefit that pupils see um because that's what teachers and schools care about um so on the PSHE side um the I think it's the key stage two theme is living in the wider world and there's some kind of opportunities to tie in with that and um, there's been a lot of talk about oracy recently that's kind of becoming a bit more of a buzzword um obviously lots of the activities we do um and um advise on the platform are around conversation building and um, confidence building and um, type techniques and um, sometimes uh, schools will use it as a school council um, idea or something for people premium and um, we kind of aim to leave it quite flexible but have some of those different ideas floating around so that we can tie it into different schools um, 
we tend to do quite sort of targeted looking at the website what are the values what are the big themes um so that we can um speak the language that that, that particular school is is um interested in um and then as Sarah was saying um the reassurance piece is really important so um having the a bank of activities that is provided on the platform um having some sort of template risk assessments um some safeguarding tips so things like we we have very um strong rules on our, our programs that um all children are always supervised by adults from the school there should never be an opportunity for a child and an older person to be alone together um we're actually having a, a safeguarding review at the moment with um, an expert from um, a local council has been working um so sort of children's and adult social care for 20 years um who's going to kind of finish reviewing off our guidance before it before the before the platform um goes out to a bigger audience and um, because that's really important and we want to do it really well um but it's definitely um it's definitely something that we have once we we get through to the right people in schools and um, they tend to be really excited about it's a free school trip ultimately and um it's a really nice way of um of expanding learning outside the classroom and it can work for children who don't like what learning in the classroom as much um the challenge is normally um getting through to the right people and then being able to to reassure them through those and um, those initial hurdles and that's um that's something that we're kind of continuing to learn and build on but um, have already have already been able to build partnerships in those spaces um, but yeah it sounds like a, a conversation Adina if you'd be up for yeah, it it's nice to connect definitely we're, we're London based but also Bognor Regis Brighton we're all over so I think that'll be a really good kind of project to initiate I think it's really important you know the pushback you're getting from the schools Nadine which is the you know they're just going this it, you know there's nothing in it for our kids is that the main is that the main they're just saying you know like the time frames of will it be an after school club how does it work the parents you know have they kind of I think there's a lot of questions and I obviously I was excited because I thought oh this sounds really good because we've got gardening projects going on and young people learn about gardening you know that our older um, residents really love gardening and they used to when you talk to them just go to their coffee mornings they talk about we used to go to the assemblies we used to watch their plays they used to, do you know what I mean? And all of these kind of memories that they used to have, and then it just stopped. And they just want to know, you know, like they really engaged with that. They looked forward to those sort of things, you know. Um, and at the moment, we're trying to kind of create a sensory gardening inside one of our housing schemes, you know, for the dementia kind of trying to keep it age friendly and 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 inclusive. And it would be nice for them to come and utilize that space as well. Do you know what I mean? So there's so much cross benefits you know with baking they've got a kitchen that they can use there's just so much they could do really um if we can just break that initial barrier really with with the schools but also probably you know and it's a very different mindset to have but it's also a phenomenal way to get people aware of what the social housing sector actually does because people hear housing they immediately think domiciliary care that's what they think it is particularly at that age and a lot of parents and people who aren't affiliated with the sector think and i think if you can go look actually this is my job. This is what I do here. It's that career talk. It's that kind of mindset of actually that this is a whole world of careers that you don't even know exist. You know, maybe when you grow up, you don't want to be, you want to do public sector, but you don't want to be police and you don't want to be NHS and you don't really want to do care. Well, hang on, there's this. I, I think it's a huge, a huge benefit. Charlotte, I can see you <laughs> coming in there. Oh, no, um, uh, I was just going to say also that, um, a lot of the children often live in, in the same housing association community because um the school and the scheme uh, are on the estate and so a lot of the children are often from the same um tenants in the same housing association which um is another kind of benefit from a community investment point of view yeah. i think i didn't even know this job exists I, I studied community development and leadership and actually one of some of our modules were uh, housing so to have something where they both combined and young people don't really know much about community development work um, and where that sits. You know, they know like social work, they might know youth work, but actually community development work is, is a preventative way of working, um, which makes a great impact in the community. So, yeah. And in a sector which desperately needs to attract young people to it, this is this is a phenomenal way to look at it because you, those memories will hold on. And who knows, if you can build that relationship with your, with your housing provider as well through those means, then, then all the better. Sharon, thank you for being uh, patient. Do please come in. No, no problem at all. Thank you very much. So yeah, I, I'm I'm just going to take it back um a little bit. Uh, the conversation. Fine. 
And um, one of the biggest issues facing communities and housing providers and local authorities is antisocial behaviour. And I just wanted to just go back to your social action programme um, where you spoke about the work that you're doing with 14 to 16 year olds. And um, just to add in there, um, during ASB Awareness Week, Resolve conducted a YouGov survey. And as part of the um, findings from that YouGov survey, we found that 49% of young people spend most of their free time in the bedrooms, which kind of correlates with your older people who are spending um, you know, a lot of their time watching television. But we know that the media perpetuates um, young people as the perpetrators of antisocial behaviour when in fact they're not. There is no, um, there is no data which correlates that headline that young people are perpetrators of antisocial behaviour, that they are the main ones. Yes, we know that some do, but it's actually adults who are the main perpetrators. And so we're just, um, when you, you mentioned in some of the local challenges that you face, I, would, I just wondered um, if you did anything around um, challenging this um, headline by the media, if you do anything around that, you know, to change, to help change perceptions within communities, because we often find that it's um, media led in, you know, causing some of the biggest issues that we face. And so that was my question um, to you. Do you do anything with the media to challenge the narrative that they put out there? Sarah, Charlotte, who'd like to come in on that one? Sarah, over to you. I'll, I'll come in. I'll come in first, and I'll probably hand over to Charlotte as well to say some more specific previous work as well. Um, she's got more experience uh, in in the organisation, so can draw on some more specific examples. But I think, I think the the key point that I wanted to come in on is the fact that all of our work is to do with this this countering ageism, um, and we may have some sort of more specific examples of of doing this quite directly, but we see the power in doing it in in these softer forms of having conversations and in, and encouraging conversations and that that coming from community upwards you know just through just through an older person having a conversation with a young person they might change that preconception in their head that's like this person is violent or like this person is involved in this behavior and be like oh turns out they're really great um and so we see the power in those more sort of small forms of conversations to just just change people's mindsets and just allow people to see the world differently and counter ageism in that way. Um, Charlotte, do you want to come in in terms of any other additional maybe media stuff we've done or or examples in the in social action program? Mm. Yeah, I think the answer is probably not. Uh, it's it's a great idea. I love the idea. Not loads. We're quite a small charity. We haven't done loads of media stuff. Um, we are kind of exploring doing it a little bit more. When we have done things like for our social action campaign recently, we did do a press release for that. And the thinking when we're going all the way back to like kind of theory of change, is it worth spending time on doing that, is exactly what you were saying, Sharon. We would like these young people to be seen in their community for the like fantastic social action work they're doing. We'd like the, the, these older people to be seen for that as well. And um, so it is worth it to try and get a local news story about um, intergenerational social action projects being done really well because it it contributes in that kind of drip, drip, drip to, to changing perceptions. Um, it's not something we've done lots of so far, um, although we are starting some work um, in partnership with Clarion, Places for People and Sovereign um, on intergenerational social action as part of the I Will um, Youth Social Action Project. Um, and I think for that, we would love to have a bit more um, kind of wider publicity, um, as you say, to try and um, to try and contribute positively to that narrative that is often not very positive. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it would also be be fun to sort of talk about it with the with the groups and see what comes up and see what um, I, the thing that I immediately think would come up is that the uh, the older participants would say that's what everyone always thought about us as well. You know, people growing up in the the, the perceptions of teenagers in the 60s and 70s um I think there could be some really interesting conversations to have about that um between the between the generations as well thank you I think there's not uh, you know um and thank you Matt for the opportunity but uh, if 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 we could touch base outside of here 
um, I think that would be really, really good. But just on a final note, it just makes math way, because yeah, again, when Michelle said about um, the no ball game signs, you know, when I was growing up, we used to have play streets and I'm sure some of us here remember those. So there was a specific street where you could go and play, you know, if there wasn't a park nearby. And now all children see is, no, you can't do that here. Even in the park, they're not allowed to play in the park after a certain time, which I find uh, ridiculous. Um, but you are right, more needs to be done because 58% of people do not report antisocial behaviour and we know that young people are more likely to be victims of antisocial behaviour. So anything that we can do, you know, to change that and help, um, you know, to build communities and be more connected, then we'd love to be a part of that. Thank you. Uh, just, a, I guess, an open question for, for Sarah, Charlotte or, or anyone else in the group. Do you find you get more interaction from what well, the last thing I want to do is kind of make it go like oh yeah all all people in older people services will absolutely be on board with this but I imagine there's some that do and some that don't do you find there's a, a gender disparity at all do you find it's there's a a difference with um people from I hate socioeconomic classes but you know what I mean like are, are there people who are more engaged or less engaged from we've talked about young people and and those from uh, the benefits, I guess, from uh, the schools and things. Do you find anything from those you're speaking with in the schemes that make people more willing or interested in getting involved with this? Because surely they're also asking, well, what are they getting out of it other than, you know, I, I say other than company, but loneliness isn't the only uh, thing we're trying to troubleshoot here. I don't think there's specific real like demographic divides in it at all you know we have a we have a massively diverse range of older people who are involved in keen I, I think the things that are really interesting that come up as trends is maybe people who had maybe worked with children when they were um when they were working we've got people who have got a lovely example of um in one of our programs in Greenwich of an old person in sheltered housing who used to work at the primary school and the children are always very excited to see them so I think that tends to be maybe more of the trend of like people who are more keen to be involved in in the programs um I think as you say rightly you know this it's not something that appeals to absolutely everybody and that's okay um it just takes you know uh, we, we get sort of groups tends to be try and have smaller groups of children and smaller groups of older people so we can really encourage those um those really productive conversations um but the the people that we do get we try to get people who are like really keen to be involved we say we try and make it so it's a space of really building purpose for old people and have them as as volunteers in our program so um so yeah i think it doesn't tend to be i don't, I don't think we really see trends of demographic split as i say it's just it's, uh, people who like spending time with children and like spending time um look in their communities as well so yeah is there anything else you want to come on that charlotte too or um i think the the other thing that would possibly say is that um we tend to get the the kind of coffee morning crew um as the the first people who'll who'll take part in a shelter scheme and um, because those are the people who are already engaged in things that are happening there um, and we try and reach beyond um, that group of people, um, if possible. Um, so as as a lot of people here will, will understand that that kind of the people who are chronically lonely um, are harder to engage. And it takes a lot more kind of gentle door knocking relationship building um, to kind of form those relationships. So um, with our direct delivery programs, that's definitely something that we, we try and do. Um, but yeah demographically it kind of goes in waves sometimes one scheme will will kind of uh, tend to skew slightly older for example um or or, or in, in other directions but um across the board it is pretty it's pretty mixed um which we love it's great yeah. that's right it was, it, i guess it was a question from that that piece you mentioned there almost about those, those hard to reach people it gives i know it sounds an awful way to phrase it but another tool to kind of go well look this is another way we're trying to integrate as a housing provider to you know, to try and do something different. I think we're in a world where we look at the maybe the, the media narrative around social housing isn't isn't brilliant. Let's not let's not beat around the bush there. There are more and more pressures, rightfully, uh, for some businesses uh, for ways they're trying to interact with people rather than going, well, we gave them a call last week, no one answered, we'll call them again in two weeks. Like, 
that th this gives more actual kind of look we're trying to do something and maybe they will never engage with the housing association but they might engage with the school or they might engage with the community project and i think the wider piece is around you know obviously if, even still focused on generationally i know sharon mentioned uh, i think it was sharon or someone mentioned earlier about um the gardening projects that they had going on it might have been uh, nadine um you know these things are so important going well what other ways are we doing to try and actually truly interact with our with our tenants with our customers so that we are troubleshooting those issues that, that do arise um and i know it's why when i first spoke with both charlotte and sarah i wanted to, to bring this to the table today really um I guess that we're moving into the last kind of five, six minutes, really, Sarah. I mean, what would you, I know we've already touched on it a little bit, but in terms of how housing providers could communicate with yourselves or businesses like it, what would you like to see from, from housing now to, um, I guess, to really truly have an impact with this? Because it isn't something, what, what's been clear from those we've spoken today is people going, yeah, this is brilliant, but it isn't something we've heard an awful lot about. So what would you like to see more of? What, what do you think housing could, you know, if there's something you could ask them to do from tomorrow, what what could they genuinely start doing to, to have an impact in this kind of in this kind of uh, arena, as it were? I think I think it's not it's not one specific action. I think it's having those. I think there's a, a series of actions really. You know, it's it's having those conversations about what are you really what can you really tangibly what are you doing to connect with your local community. Um, having those conversations about whether there is an opportunity in your current sheltered schemes or um, in your current housing to to connect with your local community and to connect generations together, particularly, as I say, where where you might have more age segregated housing. Like, is, have you got a have you got an underused lounge? You know, could that be a shared space for for these kind of activities? So it's having the having the conversations about how can you connect with your community, having the conversations being like, how, how would this work in our location? And then it would also be great if you if you were, were keen to work within common or to have a bit of a chat about what we've been doing. Um, and we're always happy to share our knowledge and experience with others. As we say, we, we really want to help empower others to do this work because we know that as mentioned earlier a lot of the sort of initial there's a there are initial barriers in place and we can say like we've actually found through trying and testing that that these specific approaches work so do reach out my email's in the in the chat so that's an, that's another action that you can do and we're, we're happy to have a chat whether it just be about you asking questions about how that might work in in your scheme, or you asking specific questions about how you might like to work within Common, we would love to we would love to chat with you. So um, yeah, really just just having conversations, I think, is probably the probably the next step, and I think that's the really important thing. Is like we want this to to start a conversation and help people to keep thinking a little bit differently and keep thinking about how they can do things differently in their in their communities. I think that key word is community and it's exactly that. I know so many community services that genuinely have such an impact if you can just get them off the ground and yeah, half the time it's just getting started. And when you do, you see you reap the rewards of just getting started. Charlotte, any last kind of thoughts from yourself? Anything you'd like to add or are you okay today? No, Sarah's covered it all, but it's lovely. It's been lovely to be here. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Uh, I don't think we've got any kind of last questions that hour is absolutely flown by. So thank you so much for bringing it to the table today. I think it's, um, you know, Sharon's just put in the chat there, to reconnect with our communities, we need to consider reframing our services. First one is, is opening times. Many people with chronic illnesses are not functioning in the morning. Office hours can be quite restrictive. And I think that, that that idea of community has been what's really resonated throughout the round table this year. People want to see it. People working in the sector want to see this. It's just about bringing them ideas. And if it's in common, even if just like you say, Sarah, initiating that that first conversation to kind of go, look, this sounds like a good idea. We're already trying this. A bit like Nadine said before, you know, we're trying this. What are your thoughts? Let's just encourage discussion, get it more out into the into the main field. So thank you, Sarah, for bringing it to the table today. Thank you, Charlotte, for, for collaborating and, and your support with the section. Please do reach out to in common if you have any questions. Um, and thank you to everybody who could come on and and, and ask questions today because the, these roundtables work better when we've got so many people who, we bring more thoughts and ideas to the table than I would never think of. Um, next week, a bit of a different session. Um, Jenny Blake is bringing the subject of burnout to the session, which is 
absolutely key and probably I'm sure everybody has felt at one time or another, including those in comments. <laughs> uh hopefully that will be another brilliant session this will go up onto youtube please feel free to share it like it etc and it should be up on spotify within the week but for now a massive thank you to sarah to charlotte for being common for bringing this to the table today and i look forward to speaking to you all soon thank you very much thank Thanks, you Matt. bye bye Cheers.